Um, anybody can open with a question, and it can be directed at all or a specific panelist. Yes, Jim? Uh, assessment, like how do you guys assess? Like what's a good go to way of assessing tests? Or, or, I mean, like after you've, like, let's say you've taught for a month and you need to assess them, what do you do? Do you do it orally? Do you do it written? Do you do both? I think both are, both are fine. Um, it depends on the child, and um, I do have a lot of, like, um, in math class, it's nice to do a lot of oral assessment. You can, because sometimes the kids, if you go around, it's even working in the groups. You have a checklist, you take some anecdotals, you'll have some assessment pieces when they're learning throughout the unit, um, so especially for those kids who really struggle with the written assessment pieces at the end. So you just sort of like repeat, like have like examples of stuff that you've already done for like the previous classes, <coughs> and then just like put that on a test and have them redo it, or do you take it further and have them buy what you taught them and try to see if they can do something better or Yeah, you know? so I like first of all before any unit I usually do a diagnostic and yeah. it's like what yeah, you like, said, yeah, like, like a what? test, a, a typical yeah. kind of test, just so I have a gauge of where they are. Then once I see the diagnostic I can see like how much intensity I need for any particular area. And then what I'd like to do is um, like you can have oral tests, I usually do that in the form of presentations, and then the written is like a little kind of paragraph or a sentence or a film of like it depends like on the level. But what I do with EA, uh, my ESL classes that I think is brilliant, uh, I use a blank rubric. So instead of the rubric having all these words, because they are difficult words even for me to understand sometimes, I leave the rubric completely blank. But of course, you know, like I leave communication, all those standard things that we, we do a whole lesson on a rubric. Like you might spend a ton of time just talking about the rubric with them, and that can even be an assignment. And then I leave it blank so that me and the student and I can fill it in together and say a four is how hard you've tried and how many times you did drafts. I really appreciate that. But a one is your grammar, let's just say. And that means that you haven't done the passive tense at all in this entire thing and this was supposed to be the passive tense so you can be like so specific when you leave it blank and then the student knows oh I didn't do the passive tense in communication so that's why I got a one here otherwise it's just like if you just circle the rubric they get it back but it doesn't mean something for them and then what I often do is I say okay if you can fix this we can reassess it so then I just tell them uh, and this is something that you'll find, like, you can offer it, and then the students will actually take you up on it. And you have to keep editing, I mean, like, marking again, and giving them a chance to fix it. But that's the whole point of ESL, I think, is that you are learning, and it's an ongoing process. So if they want to do it again, and they learned something, and they have improved, then you should adjust their mark accordingly. At least that's my philosophy, not everyone agrees. So I'll give them multiple chances to do the exact same thing, and each time I'll say like what I'm looking for and how they have or haven't missed the mark. Or what about like a diagnostic? What would be like a quick diagnostic that you might do? So let's it say depends on the kid, right? Well, for me it's a bit different because high school. So let's say ESL C, um, we have we have to learn present tense of the verb to be. So I can give just like a little quick. Uh, fill in the blank test of the verb to be. Like conjugate? Yeah, conjugate. exactly. Conjugate. Oh, yeah, I can just say conjugate all the verb to be. And then it doesn't count. It's not for marks. You know, you make clear just for fun. And then you take everybody. They don't even have to put their name necessarily. That way it's totally feeling like they're safe. Yeah. And then you just see where your class is. And then you can go from there. And diagnostic doesn't always have to be a formal test. Like it could no. be them doing an activity and a presentation and you just make some notes, okay, these, these, this class needs to work on this, this, and this. Um, the other big thing I was just thinking about assessment is like there's such a push from the ministry, so it's probably in all school boards, to do triangulation of assessment. Have you been learning about that? Mm -hmm. So they don't, like you're not doing only product based uh, assessments, so, so that's test assignments, but you're also doing observations and conversations. So like observations are typical for phys ed class. You observe kids doing a skill and you give them a mark, but that's not necessarily something that's consistently done in math and language and 
history, but they're trying to get teachers to do that more. And conversations is like conferencing, sitting and listening to the kids. So you're not just doing the final. <coughs> so that's been a huge push um, the last number of years from the ministry in the schools. We've been feeling that. Um, so moving towards triangulation of your assessment strategies. Do you do that? Um, I, do you guys do that? Like, do you guys like would you assess, sit down, observe, and converse with them on top of testing? Informally, probably, yeah. but like formally, no. Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> we teach in the primary yeah. division. We probably have a slightly different take on this. Yeah, so in the primary division, we don't really do, well, in grade three, I think we do a lot of testing. In grade one and two, we don't do as much testing. In grade two, we do um, a lot of <coughs> testing in math. And math is really easy to test. I always say that math is the universal language because no matter what, language your child, your, your student speaks in your classroom, you can, math connects us all. And so, of course, if you just take the words out of it and there's no story problems, you can assess their math. So math is really easy to assess. And we usually give tests for math, but for everything else, we don't give tests in, in grade one and grade two. So it's more of those other parts of the triangle, the, the anecdotal and, um, what was it, the anecdotal and the conversation. And sometimes, like, for example, in science, if they were working in groups on, like, for example, recently we did simple machines, and they had to build a simple machine. They were in groups in the hallway. And so you just go around with the clipboard, and you assess based on, you, you're going to put on that ESL lens, you know, and you're going to um, assess your student based on where you think they should be at, based on what step they're at at, at that point. So it's a little bit more loosey-goose, I think, in primary. Yeah, I think uh, Ryan is able to join us again. The 10 minutes of announcements are over. So I'm going to ask you to do two things, Ryan. Um, we did have uh, a, a really useful question about um, how to do assessment with ELLs in the classroom. And then there was also your advice to this group of NOMS teachers. Okay. Oh, yeah. Okay. So the advice that I was going to give, it's an old, tired old one, but um, it's one that I've struggled with. Uh, it's that family school connection that you have to keep in communication with parents or whatever caregivers the ELLs have um, can be extra hard if they're, they don't speak English either. And so, <clears throat> although it's very challenging, I find that it helps um, because if these families have just moved to Canada and they don't, they aren't familiar with this kind of a school system, they don't always understand what ESL, the ESL program is, and so it's important to keep in touch and try and, and make it clear what you do and, and what's going on with the extra support. Um, I like to, I'm sure you've heard this a thousand times, I like to make sure that I'm calling home to give good news before I ever have to call home to give bad news. So uh, make sure that you get in there early in the year or early after the student has arrived and, and say, you know, oh, so-and-so did an amazing job reading her one page of reading today in class, something like that, and then sort of build the relationship from there. Uh, so that's my advice, the homeschool connection. You can use a communication book too. Sometimes it's easier than having a phone conversation if you write down whatever your message is because I know my children go to a French school and it helps me to be able to see things written out rather than just have to try and have a conversation in French all the time. Um, and then the second question was about assessment? Yes. Okay, so, uh, um, uh, there have been assignments uh, in this school where I was responsible for assessing, assigning a grade, for example, to a, a poetry anthology that the grade six students had to do. And again, um, the Google Classroom setup really helped me with that because I could see um, all of their work and I could access it from wherever. 
And I could also see what, I mean, I'm not super familiar with the grade six curriculum, so well, not that you assess some, a student compared to another student, but I, it was helpful for me to be able to see some, some norms, some benchmarks of where an 11 year old should be with their poetry writing and, and, uh, and then be able to evaluate the ESL students on, um, you know, in, with that framework in mind. However, if students qualify for ESL, then they get, it's kind of like having an IEP. Um, one, one more super loud thing for you. Uh, in that you can, uh, you can really, you're, it's okay to just meet them where they are with assessments and assignments. So if the assignment is to write 12 poems and six different kinds of poems and whatever, and that's just not going to be feasible, then it's totally fine to have them write three poems and they can still get an A or a B because you're checking off that little ESL box. Or nine, or um, Ryan, I'd like to thank you because I know that you are going on a field trip with your um, students, so we'll all wave goodbye to you. <laughs> And we'll let you um, go off and um, have a good afternoon out of the school. Okay. Yeah, it's, a, it's actually a very exciting ESL field trip that we're going on. The TDSB publishes a, a magazine every year of student of ESL student work. And then for the magazine launch, they have a big party and invite all the kids whose submissions got in. So I'm about to take three uh, ESL students of different ages to a uh, a celebration of their writing. Oh, that's wonderful. That's exciting. All right. All right. Bye-bye. Right. <laughs> <Bye. laughs> I just want to mention one more thing about assessment. Like, for some of your kids who are brand new, um, especially ELB students who I talked about last week, or if you're teaching in a middle school and it's a grade 7 class and they don't know any English yet, um, you may only be doing an anecdotal report card and not assigning marks. So in that case, you, I would say anecdotes and like, right, just taking, you know, having a couple pages where you keep some observations of what the kids are doing, that's essential in that case. Um, is that a follow-up question? No, it's a completely different Okay, we, we need, we'll take somebody over here. Um, I was just wondering, okay, I was at a, a school from my second practicum where the population was like 90% Filipino students. And the same thing, one kid would arrive like that day, some of them have been there for a year, some have been there their whole lives. And there was often a time when we would overhear them speaking, because most of the kids in the class spoke the same language, they spoke like Tagalog, or Tagalog, I don't know. Tagalog? Yeah. And uh, we'd overhear them speaking to each other, and my AT would often be like, no, stop, like, speak in English. I don't know if that's a bad idea. Okay, well, I'm just going to go ahead and do it. <laughs> uh, that's a bad idea. Because it's like a punish for speaking your language, right? You're supposed to encourage it, but I, in moderation or in the, the right, the right, the appropriate context. So, for example, if it's the teacher said something and the student didn't understand, and he needs or she needs clarification, speak your language. You need to. It's the only way you'll understand. And of course, the brain actually works that way. So, in order to understand something foreign, you have to, like, it has to connect with something you already know. So, there's no way they're just going to all of a sudden, like, get English. Um, so, that's necessary. And then it's also the connotation of being punished for your language or that it's not good enough in this classroom. So I would actually embrace it, bring it in, say, hey, do you know that word in Tagalog? Well, maybe 80% of you do, but 20 don't. So let's let's all learn that. That's important for us. Oh, haven't you ever like seen pictures of the Philippines? It's like this most beautiful place ever. I want to go. Like you can embrace whatever it is. If they bring it in, then you should embrace it, but just use some rules to, to harness it so that it's not out of control. I always, I always um, make the students feel like speaking more than one language is an asset and it's never something that they have to check in at the door before they come in. They, they, I always tell my students they are welcome to speak their, their home languages and work in the classroom. It makes my skin crawl a little bit for hearing you say that. Sorry. 
Yeah, um, no, no, it's okay. I think it's Jeff. Okay, can you actually, though, this is one of the issues when we send teacher candidates into classrooms and encounter a situation where the AT does or says something that's polar opposite of the here, here. Can you give some language to folks? Like, how might they approach that topic? And besides saying, at university I learned, can you give them some language to what they might actually engage the AT with to, to change that? I mean, even maybe just saying, um, you know, that's kind of what I, I used to think too with our English language learners, but um, I, I don't know, I, I, I was learning that it's actually really important for them in their language development and it helps them, um, you know, to, yeah, you try something. Or mention the name Jim Cummins. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Ever heard of Jim Cummins? Uh, perhaps maybe you want me to share this article with you, or, or I'd love to do a PD for the whole school. Um, because I got this wonderful article from Jim Cummins on multi-literacies, and then, you know, it's not exactly about speaking their first, or their, their whatever language in the classroom, but you just mention it as a broad topic, and then that is, of course, the crux of it, and they'll get it, hopefully, indirectly, maybe. Yeah. And the conversation with parents, because I think a lot of parents feel that they also are, should not be speaking they, they, they mother tongue at home with their children. Now they've immigrated, now they need to speak English at home. And I always have a conversation with parents, keep up your mother tongue if you have a strong mother tongue. This is all from all of you. If you have a strong mother tongue, then their second language will follow. And you wouldn't believe how many teachers are telling parents, practice speaking English with your child. And I say, no, like your vocabulary in your, in your mother tongue is this big. Your vocabulary in English is smaller. Provide your child with wide vocabulary and they will see those words in English as well. So those conversations, be, be the role model in, in your school, that's what I said. Sorry, I'll also just uh, add the dimension of identity, because it's my favorite. Um, like a lot of children's identities are tied to their languages. And so if you ask them to stop speaking that language, you're asking them to stop expressing part of who they are. Um, so I think that's really important. And we, what was, I cannot remember her name, even though she was like the most amazing person that she came to our class last semester. Um, she was your student, and uh, she came, I think, the same day as Jim. Gail Prasad, yeah. So she does this incredible activity where she asks the students to think of a blank body, and she asks them to color it in with different languages, and probably you've heard of it or did it. And so maybe you can introduce that activity to the class or to the teacher, and then go in an indirect passing kind of way to yeah. um, here. Yes, I want to talk about accent. Like for many years, I have some, sometimes I do have strong accents. So what do we do about it? We just discourage it because sometimes it can prevent others from understanding them properly. Or is it part of their identity and their life? Okay. I actually find the opposite in elementary school. I think ch the young children um, are really strong mimics mm -hmm. as part of their development, and they can like pick up a Canadian accent pretty fast. And then people say they're not ESL, but they're they can't do the work, right? So, so I, I, and it's interesting because like I have colleagues um, who have much stronger English language skills, but people will say they're ESL because they have an accent. Like people often like confuse accent with like. Yeah, uh, they have a different accent than the Canadian. So, um, so I think with, I, that's not something I really worry about with elementary students because uh, I um, the conversational skills and the um, the accent they got in the environment they're in. Um, it's more of the academic uh, um, the academic vocabulary. That's the focus. Uh, I don't know. For me, that's super awkward because um, in high school, it's true. Some of the students come and. I really have such a hard time, and my ear is quite good at understanding like almost anything, uh, but there are some students who are, I, I can't, I'm trying to assess, you know, and I can't, I don't know if they said a word or not, and, and I don't know to what extent, like I've been trying to research this myself, to what extent it's, it's favorable, because I know sometimes you can't even, you can't change or modify an accent, like my dad, for example, who's speaking English for 40 something years, heaviest accent you've ever heard, and he's trying, like that for his name is his very best. 
So I don't know like, to what extent it's even feasible. So if you were to mention it, and then how delicately you tread when you mention it, I think it would depend on the time and the place and the student and how you feel. But just, it's, it's I, maybe you know. I don't well, I mean, it's really, for me, about comprehensibility. So when does an accent impede others from understanding? And I think when there's an impediment, and in fact it starts impacting on the ability for teachers to assess them, then I think you really have to work with them on comprehensibility. And it's not always um, what we think of as accent, the way the words might sound like a, a Greek accent or uh, some other accent. It's also about you know, the intonation, the modulation, sometimes how loudly the student is speaking, whether or not they're projecting their voice. So there are some aspects of communication that you can focus on that are targeting directly identity. You can help them to understand People will be able to hear you better if you know your head is down and your head is up and you're uh, speaking a little more loudly. So I think working on it from a comprehensibility uh, point of view is important. It's kind of in the, in the same vein as that question is, um, I talk all the time, but despite that fact, my class is definitely better than that one. Um, I'm not a very confident speaker. I, I had a, a pretty severe speech impediment. I would say um and like, and I talk too quickly, I talk too slowly, I talk too loudly, I talk too softly. And I worry about how that will impact my students. And it's something I work on all the time, but at the same time, I know all of us, a lot of us are not perfect speakers. Um, and, and how does that impact our ELLs? Can I tell you something really funny that 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 happened to me. So, <laughs> back to my dad. He said to me, my dad said to me that I use the word like all the time. And he said, you should count because you don't understand how many times you say it. So I did one day. I said, you're blind. And I recorded myself and I counted and I, I was shocked. I say it an exorbitant amount of time. So I asked the students. I told them the story. They found it really funny that their teacher is like this valley girl. Um, <laughs> and I asked them to pick the things that they thought were horrible when I present, and and not just me because I said that I have like a I have some sensitivity. Like pick some other people in the class, but don't name them. Say the things that you think are terrible. Let's make a list of the terrible things. So we said saying like talking with your head down, talking quietly, being like this, whatever, uh, talking too loudly because one guy talked so loudly. Uh, so we made a list and then we all had to act them out. Like we each had to come up, it was a presentation and act out all those things. You had to say like the alphabet in those ways. And it was just such a funny and memorable experience that they really tried not to in the rest of their presentations. And they would even like remember, they would like poke each other and I know they were referencing the presentation because I could see their, them doing the Thing. So you have to find a way to make it uh, funny or kind, but bring their attention to it because it is important. I, I have reduced my likes, believe it or not. <laughs> you don't say that often. <laughs> yeah, you're supposed to record yourself. Sorry, interrupt. Okay, yeah. Like I, because what when I started, I started teaching in Korea. They, my like my mentor, the guy that taught me to teach, like crash course within like a week. I was teaching. Record you for like three classes, and I, I would say okay, I'd be like, okay, okay, and then like 50 within like two minutes saying okay. So you should record yourself and listen because you will. You'll end up yeah, like, that's such a good idea. Have the student, have the students like, like I remember my dad had a retirement speech and he was gonna get like blubbery and cry, and whenever he would start to get like upset, my brother and I would just go like this, and that would make him feel comfortable. So if you're doing some weird cue or like some weird neurotic. Thing like your like hands are twitchy or you're like looking around like you're doing some something that you shouldn't be doing. Have your students point it out for you so that you stop like you're a dog in the train. <laughs> <laughs> some, some people back here had uh, questions. Okay, go ahead. Uh, we were talking earlier about use of <coughs> L ones in the classroom and this idea of having an appropriate context for it. So it seems to me like the kind of thing that you really want. I imagine there's a lot of balancing, but you also want clear expectations in terms of classroom rules. Um, are there any specific rules that you would recommend for allowing students to use their L1 without 
No swearing. <laughs> no swearing. <laughs> Actually, you have to deal with that. Like, you do, you laugh, but it's, they swear in your first language. But they tell you. They tell <laughs> you. You don't want to get cheat sheets. Those are swear words in all my languages. I pretty much know all the models. <laughs> and Leanne, what about the primary level? Are there any recommendations you have around some guidelines for usage, or it's not been an issue in primary? It's not been an issue. In fact, you know, you really actually have to work as a teacher to encourage your students to use their use their L1 in the classroom. Most of the time, they're they're silent until they start to speak English, and then and then they start and then they start to use English. Um, so you really have to create a great, create the atmosphere in the classroom where it's okay for them to use it and okay for your students to speak to each other. I find mostly they don't. So I haven't had an issue. I had more of an issue trying to get them to be comfortable to use it in the classroom. Mia? I, I think you definitely need rules though from day one because I've had the opposite where they just constantly speak in their language and I took it too far or I guess I encouraged it too much. So you need to say, like, if I'm talking, what I mean, you're, whatever you're comfortable with, but if I'm talking or another student is talking or another teacher, you cannot speak, period, in any language. Um, the other thing I think is, like, if you want to say it, but you don't have, you want to write it down, maybe. So that's the other thing I say. You, just because you can't speak your first language out in class all the time, we have certain guidelines about that. I uh, will give a vocabulary list, and I'll make sure that there's my certain language and that they put the word in that language as well. So it can be a written form that they can keep communicating in and that way it doesn't disturb the class in the same way that speaking might or like that some people might feel uncomfortable because they don't speak the same language. And you'll find maybe a nice balance by using different communication modes or symbols and things like that. But definitely have rules. And I think we have time for just one last question. Somebody from the back. I saw some hands up that I missed before. All so the I have two questions that since you're very practical with the first one. Um, so if you're trying to speak with a student and they're they're very low in their English language, will it, and there's nobody within the community or whatever that can't translate, who will translate just sucks. Is there somebody that the TVSB would pay for, like to come help communicate and do that media? Or is that not really an option? Yeah, there are there are translators. You usually have to have put it up two weeks ahead. For parent, for parent teacher interviews, right. and it does cost yeah. money for, okay. for the school. Um, we we really try like to use our settlement workers, and uh, but then it's hard, and we usually can. Okay. Yeah, but it's hard if you have like one kid who speaks one language. But you know what? We actually need translators for kids a lot of the time who aren't even ESL students. Like you, it's it's so random yeah. who uh, who needs translators for their parents. Like a lot of times the newcomers, they don't want translators. They want to like I can speak like you know that's really important to them. Okay, um, and then so if you have a student that you're really trying to it's an EL student and then you're really trying to integrate them into the classroom but they have no personal motivation to learn English they're just like no I just have to be here. What are some strategies that you use to motivate them? Or have you not really found that? Yeah, I know yeah. that happens all the time. Oh, okay. <laughs> so you can use their parents the way um, she was saying, like have c c communication with the parents because the parents are good uh, help. I don't know. I'm sure in elementary school the students don't come on visas, do they? No. The way our students don't yeah. have parents. Yeah. Okay. So you wouldn't have that issue. So the parent or guardian. Um, I would say also ask them their goal. You know their future goal. Um, even if it's like a year goal or a month goal. And doesn't that sometimes involve speaking English? Or um, why did your parents bring you here? The whole guilt trip thing works sometimes. Getting them involved in the school in certain activities. Like, I do think, though, that's very different, like in a secondary setting yeah. where everyone's speaking the same language, you know, and they're visa students. Like I would say in an elementary school, the students who've settled here, like they're very motivated to learn English. Yeah. Uh, then the, where you've got to motivate them is to keep their first language. Okay. Yeah, but I can see that with like Visa International students. So like, why am I, you know, I'm here to hang out. Yeah, it's not important. Yeah. And I agree with you that in terms of keeping up their first language, the, the attrition rate of their first language is it's unbelievable. Um, they lose it so quickly and English has this way of just taking over. So yeah, I think that's where the work needs to be in, in primary. 
So on this note, um, can we give our amazing guests?